fast, highly versatile, capable of escaping from pursuing aircraft. These are all attributes that you would expect from the aircraft with the most tonnage of total shipping sunk during World War II. The Swordfish was none of these things. Designed by Ferry Aviation Company in 1933 as a dual-purpose biplane spotter torpedo bomber, the new aircraft, designated TSR-1, was created as an independent, privately financed design along the general guidelines of Air Ministry Specification S-9-30, which aimed to replace the antiquated Ferry Seal and Blackburn Baffin. Unable to find a suitor for the aircraft in Britain, Ferry began work with the Greek Air Force, who were looking to replace their old Ferry 3Fs already in service. Greek interest soon waned, however, and Ferry told the British of their work with the Greeks, proposing their aircraft for consideration. The Air Ministry was impressed with Ferry's work and released the remediated specification as 15-33. The TSR-1 first took flight from the Great West Aerodrome Heathrow on March 21, 1933, soon going through several improvements to better meet the Navy's specifications. It was also test launched from catapults aboard the battlecruiser HMS Repulse to test its efficacy as a shipborne spotter. The improved aircraft, TSR-2, first flew on April 17, 1934. Ferry's aircraft, soon renamed Swordfish, was a metal frame fabric covered biplane aircraft, seemingly more fitting of a World War I battlefield than the fast paced engagements of World War II. As for armament, the Swordfish carried single 30 caliber machine guns in both forward firing and rear defensive positions. The Swordfish is primarily famous for carrying the immensely powerful Mark 12 torpedo, weighing 1,670 pounds. Still, it could carry bombs in various configurations, depth charges, and naval mines, which it used to significant effect against Axis ports. Later versions of the plane were equipped with metal skin instead of flammable fabric and could also mount ARP-3 rockets under the wings. The biplane design made the aircraft maneuverable and created the lift required to carry heavy payloads. Still, it was abysmally slow, with a top speed of only 139 miles per hour. In addition, the aircraft's fabric and later thin metal skin left pilots vulnerable to enemy fire. The British Air Ministry ordered their first batch of 68 Swordfish in early 1936, with the first production aircraft entering service in July of that year. Swordfish production continued to swell in the ensuing years. By September of 1939, 13 operational squadrons of Swordfish were in the British inventory, along with three spotter squadrons equipped with floatplanes. Despite later earning their reputation as the bane of Axis shipping across Europe, the Swordfish spent the first few months of World War II rather uneventfully as they operated primarily in convoy escort and fleet protection actions. The Swordfish would see its first trial under fire on April 11, 1940, when aircraft launched from the HMS Furious engaged in a surprise attack on the German-held port at Trondheim. Expecting to see a fleet of German warships, the British pilots were disappointed to only see two small destroyers in the harbor. They managed to torpedo one of the ships, marking the first naval hit scored by a Swordfish. Later, during the Second Battle of Narvik, Swordfish from HMS Warspite were doing reconnaissance on German ships when they spotted the U-boat U-64. Dropping to 200 feet, the British crew dropped two anti-submarine bombs on the craft, marking the first submarine kill for the Swordfish. More aircraft would later return intent on attacking the German surface vessels, but returned home too short, having scored no hits. Swordfish would bomb the port at Narvik throughout the war, destroying ships, land facilities, and parked aircraft. A feat made difficult by extreme local terrain and the frigid temperatures, which wreaked havoc on aircrews exposed to the elements in the Swordfish's open cockpit. Nine Swordfish attacked Italian soil for the first time on June 14, 1940, soon after the Italian declaration of war. A contingent from 767 Squadron then flew to RAF El Far on Malta, commencing raids on oil tanks in Augusta, Sicily on June 30th. After the surrender of France on June 22, the remaining elements of the French fleet interspersed across Europe in a bid to escape capture by the Germans. Roughly 40% of France's fleet fled to North Africa, with the lion's share making their way to Merz el Kabir in modern-day Algeria. Although Germany promised the neutrality of the French fleet, afraid that the Germans may capture it, drastically bolstering their naval strength, the British Admiralty set out to neutralize the French fleet through diplomacy or force. A complicated correspondence ensued in which the British offered the French an ultimatum, whereby they would join the British in fighting the Axis powers, sail their ships to the French West Indies, or be destroyed. Admiral Somerville, in charge of the British fleet, sent Captain Cedric Holland of the carrier HMS Ark Royal to conduct negotiations as he spoke French. 
Admiral Marcel Bruno Gensoul, commander of the French fleet, took a front to negotiations being conducted by a West senior officer and sent his lieutenant in his place. This caused more miscommunication, and in the end, Gensoul sent a transmission to the French government indicating that his options were to join the English or be destroyed, and omitting the option to sail to the French West Indies, the preferred option of the French government. French submariners were ordered into positions around the English ships, causing Churchill to order the English to open fire at 1757. The battle began on July 3rd with swordfish dropping mines to block the entrance to the harbor just before the termination of negotiations. They also attempted unsuccessful attacks on escaping French ships. They spotted two of the French submarines dropping illumination charges on them and guiding in British destroyers. Swordfish attacks on the vessels in the harbor proved ineffective as they were thwarted by heavy fire in the presence of French fighter aircraft. Despite surface vessels destroying the Bretagne and causing severe damage to other French warships in the harbor, the attack was not deemed a total success. As a result, more swordfish were sent in to cause additional damage on July 8th. The aircraft hit the patrol boat Terre Neuve, which was moored next to the French battleship Dunkirk and heavily loaded with depth charges, which caused a massive explosion that caused severe damage to the French battleship. More swordfish were sent after the Richelieu, which caught her off the coast of Gori. They managed to land one torpedo hit, knocking many of her systems offline while also causing flooding and bending two of her propeller shafts. Three swordfish were sent to support British troops in Libya, who had been constantly harassed by German patrol boats and small surface ships. The three aircraft attacked German forces in the Gulf of Bamba, impressively managing to sink two U-boats, a destroyer, and a replenishment ship, all with only three torpedoes. By mid-1940, British naval forces were spread thin, protecting convoys in the Atlantic, defending against the German Navy, preventing the Italian Navy from disrupting supply to Africa, and supporting British territorial holdings in the east. Knowing that they had to consolidate threats to preserve their naval efficacy and outnumber 3-2 to two in terms of fast battleships in the Mediterranean, the British decided to destroy the Italian fleet to protect their assets in the Mediterranean. Initially planned for October 21st, the British planned to use swordfish stationed on the carrier HMS Illustrious to attack the main Italian fleet stationed at Taranto. However, some warships scheduled to take part in the battle were predisposed to other actions. As a result, the plan was put off until November 11th. The British began their attack using the cover of darkness to mask their approach to the harbor before two planes in the group dropped 16 flares, illuminating the Italian ships for their fellow attackers. The two flared planes then dropped bombs on the harbor's fuel tanks, further illuminating the harbor. The first full flight, comprised of three swordfish, attacked the Conti di Cavour, dropping one torpedo that scored a direct hit, blowing a 27-foot hole in the side of the ship. The Cavour retaliated by shooting down one of the swordfish that had torpedoed it. The two remaining swordfish continued to attack Andrea Doria, missing with both torpedoes. The following three swordfish to enter the engagement dropped three torpedoes at the battleship Littorio, with two of the three fish swimming to their target. The four remaining swordfish from the attack were armed with bombs, which they used to cause damage to the cruisers and destroyers in the harbor. Shortly after the first attack, a second flight of swordfish entered the fray. Two torpedoes were fired at the Littorio, with one hitting and causing more damage. The only other torpedo hit scored during the second attack landed on the battleship Diulio, tearing a 36-foot wide hole in her hull. The British aircraft returned to the illustrious Victorious, having caused irreparable damage to the Italian fleet at the loss of only two airplanes and two crew members killed and two captured. Many today attribute this low loss of aircraft to Axis gunners being unable to aim correctly due to the swordfish's low speed. While its leisurely pace certainly added to the consternation faced by those who found themselves under the sights of its torpedo, most torpedoes of the time were in fact quite temperamental, meaning that faster planes had to attack at similar speed. This meant that the swordfish was not particularly disadvantaged during its torpedo run. Instead, it is believed that it was the frequent element of surprise and excellent planning as well as the maneuverability of the swordfish that made it so effective. Two-thirds of the barrage balloons protecting the harbor had also been blown away in a recent windstorm. In addition, British torpedoes at the time swam far too deep in the water, meaning that they would theoretically slam into the bottom of the harbor instead of reaching the Italian ships. For this reason, as well as the fact that they had recently taken part in gunnery practice, torpedo netting was not as extensive as it otherwise should have been. The British managed to remedy this issue before attacking by adding oversized horizontal fins, which kept the devices closer to the surface allowing them to be effective in the comparatively shallow waters of Taranto. The Battle of Taranto was the first significant naval engagement to involve solely aircraft, 
marking a fundamental change in war tactics that has carried through to today. It also sounded the death toll of the battleship as it proved that even the most significant warship could be taken out by a relatively small number of planes. Japanese naval attaché to Berlin, Takeshi Naito, even visited the harbor at Taranto to view the consequences of the attack before briefing the Japanese naval staff that would plan the devastating attack on Pearl Harbor. He seems to have taken particular note of the method used to keep torpedoes from diving too deep, which the Japanese employed on the December 7th attack. During the later Battle of Cape Matapan on March 28th, Swordfish stationed on Crete helped disable the Italian cruiser Pola, further serving to damage the already crippled Italian navy. In addition, Swordfish also took part in the Anglo-Iraqi War in May, launching bombing raids against Iraqi nationalists led by Rashid Ali al ghailani eventually leading to the ousting of a short-lived government. Throughout the first half of the war, the British stationed a group of swordfish on Malta. These aircraft used the cover of darkness to attack German shipping, bringing supplies across the Mediterranean, without fear of reprisal from the Luftwaffe. There were never more than 27 swordfish stationed on Malta, but the small force still put up massive numbers, averaging 50,000 tons of shipping sunk per month across a nine-month period, with a climax of 98,000 tons sent to the bottom. This is especially impressive considering that many of these aircraft lacked equipment for flying at night. Swordfish attacked enemy ports and facilities along the English Channel throughout the first half of the war. The third crewman was left behind to increase range in favor of additional fuel tanks. Swordfish operations included four squadrons by the time of Germany's invasion of the Lower Countries. They targeted fuel installations, power stations, aerodromes, and later French ports that were anticipated to be used in the future invasion of England. They also set mines at the entrance to harbors along the coast to disrupt German shipping. After the destruction of their much-lauded battlecruiser HMS Hood in May 1941 at the hands of the battleship Bismarck, the British decided to respond with all available force to stop her from reaching her home port in safety. This force included the aircraft carrier HMS Victorious, which swiftly launched a nighttime sortie against the German battleship on the night amidst worsening weather conditions. The initial wave of swordfish launched by Victorious comprised mostly inexperienced pilots who accidentally nearly attacked both the Norfolk and U.S. Coast Guard cutter Modoc on their way to the Bismarck. They landed one hit on the ship. Despite causing little direct damage, rapid speed changes needed to avoid the torpedoes had loosened collision mats, allowing water to enter the vessel from an artillery hole caused by an earlier engagement. This flooded the port number two boiler room and temporarily slowed her to 16 to 20 knots, allowing British ships to begin to close range. After losing contact with the Bismarck for a period during which the Victorious had been forced to break off her attack due to fuel shortage, she was finally respotted on May 26th. A flight of swordfish from Ark Royal took off to attack her. However, Admiral James Somerville sent cruiser Sheffield to shadow Bismarck. Mistaking her for the German ship, the swordfish attacked. Luckily, the new magnetic detonators on their torpedoes failed to explode, saving the British ship. After rearming with contact detonator-equipped torpedoes, the swordfish attacked again in a group of 15. Luckily, they managed to attack the enemy this time, scoring two hits on the Bismarck. The first torpedo hit amidships and did minor damage, but the second struck her in her port stern, blocking her port rudder in a 12-degree turn. This meant that Bismarck was now doomed to sail in a large circle. After many hours of intense engagement with British surface forces, the German battleship was sent to the bottom on the 27th. While swordfish were immensely successful earlier in the war, the disadvantages presented by the old, slow biplane were beginning to take their toll. During the Channel Dash of February 11, 1942, six swordfish were sent to attack the Scharnhorst and Gneisenau as they sailed through the English Channel to stop them before they reached Germany. All six aircraft were shot down by German fighters in anti-aircraft fire, leading to the loss of 11 of the 18 swordfish crew. For this reason, the swordfish was largely phased out of the primary attack role in favor of newer, faster aircraft in the form of the ferry Albacore and eventually the ferry Barracuda. Despite no longer being used to attack German capital ships, the swordfish's reign of terror was far from over. 1,162 U-boats served in the Kriegsmarine during World War II, sinking an estimated 15 million tons of Allied shipping. As Britain's most capable short takeoff aircraft, swordfish were one of the best answers to this deadly problem. To protect their merchant shipping from the U-boat threat, the British converted 20 merchant vessels into makeshift aircraft carriers featuring a catapult, flight deck, and the ability to carry three to four swordfish in addition to either a standard cargo for tankers or partial loads on cargo vessels where holds were converted into aircraft hangars. 
This fleet was eventually equipped with 91 swordfish and helped keep Allied shipping safe throughout the war. The swordfish also helped pioneer the use of ASV radar, becoming the first aircraft to sink a submarine at night when they used the radar to do so off the coast of Gibraltar. The swordfish achieved another first on May 23, 1943, when it became the first aircraft to sink a submarine using rockets off the coast of Ireland. By July 1944, the Royal Canadian Air Force retired the last ferry albacore, the aircraft intended to replace a swordfish. However, despite being significantly older, the swordfish soldiered on. The swordfish flew its last combat missions off the coast of Norway in January of 1945, after which it was relegated to the training role. It was retired from this role in the summer of 1946. For reference, this was three years after the first flight of Britain's first jet fighter, a full seven years after the last F-3F, the United States' last biplane aircraft had rolled off the production line. During her time in service, the plane had damaged or sank 23 enemy warships to go along with approximately 1.25 million tons of other shipping. Swordfish had sunk at least 21 U-boats and destroyed countless other watercraft and land targets throughout the war.